So today, let's begin reading here in John's Gospel, in chapter 7. I'll read verses 53 in chapter 7 and verse 1 in chapter 8. And then I'm going to be moving into really looking at verses 2 through 11. But verses uh, 53 and verse 1 uh, are really introductory comments that I'll be making to lay the uh, foundation for the study that we'll be looking at today found in verses 2 through 11. So beginning at verse 53 in John 7 and reading at verse 1 in John chapter 8, John writes, everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And so when you look in uh, chapter 7, which we're not going to do, but were you to look into chapter 7, you see that the Lord Jesus Christ has been ministering. He's been ministering all day. And so at the end of the chapter, the day is now concluding, and evening has come, and the people that he's been ministering to are now beginning to disperse. Notice how it says in verse 53, everyone went to his own house. And so people were going to their own houses, but, verse 1, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So on the Mount of Olives is a place there that's called the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, this garden was more than likely owned by one of Jesus' followers. See, the Jews didn't have gardens in the city. They had them in, outside of the city because it was not lawful for them or not permissible for them to, to use fertilizer and things like that within the framework of the city. So they would have their gardens outside. And so the people would own private gardens. And they had this particular garden there in this region called the Mount of Olives. The garden was called the Garden of Gethsemane. Again, more than likely owned by one of Jesus' disciples, and his disciple would offer him the use of the garden whenever he had need. Now, by this time, it is a place that Jesus often went to. If you were to look at John 18, verses 1 and 2, it's mentioned there how that in verse 2, Jesus often met there with his disciples. So this particular garden is a garden that Jesus went to often. And so it was owned more than likely by one of his disciples, and Jesus would stay there when he was in Jerusalem on occasion. Now, what the contrast is, when it says in verse 53, everyone went to his own house, he goes on to say, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. While others returned to the comfort of their homes, Jesus walked to a garden. This is because he had no place of his own, no home of his own. So he would use that which was offered to him. In Matthew uh, 8 verses 19 and 20 uh, it reads a certain scribe came to him and said teacher I will follow you wherever you go Jesus said to him foxes have holes birds of the air have nests but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head and so Jesus lived a life that was set apart he didn't own things of his own but he relied on the on the giving of those who followed him this kind of life that he lived, though, gave him a deep personal and physical understanding, if you will, of the needs that human beings have. And Jesus, as you read your scriptures, is, is a person, is a man who went through everything and uh, every kind of thing that you and I go through. You read your Bible and you see that there are things he experienced that gives him insight and understanding to us uh, from a human level, physical, experiential insight. Uh, he, he suffered, for example, with fatigue. He got tired just like everybody else. In John 4, verse 6, it says that um, J Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus experienced physical uh, fatigue. He went through grief. He went through rejection. Isaiah 53, verse 3 says, He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. We did not esteem him. So Jesus went through fatigue, he experienced grief, he knew what rejection was like, he suffered through loneliness. John 16, verse 32, he said, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the Father's with me. So he went through those things and he knew the pain of betrayal. Psalm 41, verse 9 even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. And so I'm, I'm saying all of that to lay a foundation. Jesus Christ understands us. He's gone through what we have gone through. 
It gave him a deep personal understanding of our needs. And though he owned everything, he created all things, he didn't demand that people care for his needs. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, Paul said it like this. He said, let, let, each one of, uh, let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And so he used that which was freely offered to him. With that said, that's beginning to give us kind of an insight into where he is. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and he spent the night there. Now, early in the morning, verse 2, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. When they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, I do, and he stoned her. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I want to look at that with you today. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. The next day, it says in verse 2, early in the morning, Jesus is out at the temple. It's daybreak, and he's beginning to teach the people. And those who were hungry for his teaching came to him to learn. And the words that Jesus Christ spoke were so profound that people were willing to get up early and to make the trek to that temple just to be there with him as he shared. Now, there were reasons why they would come and listen to him. His way of teaching had an authority that was unlike any other rabbi. On one occasion, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, Matthew says that he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You see, when Jesus would teach the word of God, he didn't quote other rabbis. He didn't quote the, the teachers in the past as, as the rabbis during that day would. You see, the rabbis of Jesus' time, when they were teaching, would say, as Rabbi Shammai has said, or as, as Rabbi Hillel has said, or whatever Rabbi Gamaliel has said. They would quote other rabbis. They would quote the writings, but not Jesus. Jesus would say, you have heard it said of those of old, but I say unto you. And when Jesus would speak like that, they said, this man has authority. He doesn't speak like the other people. He doesn't teach quoting others. He is the authority. He taught them, Matthew says, as one having authority, not as the scribes. And when he taught, people would be gripped by the things that he had to say. No one ever spoke words like this man. Earlier in chapter 7, uh, they had sent some, uh, some officers to arrest Christ, and they had come back, but they hadn't arrested Jesus, and the Pharisees were upset. And it says in John 7, 45, the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why, why have you not brought him? And, and the officers answered, no man ever spoke like this man. So when Jesus would speak, People would be spellbound. They would get up early to go hear him, to hear the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. They wanted to hear this man with his incredible heavenly wisdom that he would give to them. They got up early in the morning. They went to the temple. He showed up. They were there waiting for him so that as he would share, the words that would proceed from him would feed their hungry souls. I can still remember in the early days of my Christian faith, when we were going to church, we'd go to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. These are the days before there was a church uh, building as we have today. This is before there was a tent that was put on in a bean field. This was down the street in a small chapel. And the chapel was built to hold maybe 300 people. But you had to get there early for the evening service because you wouldn't have a seat. 
And there were times that there were 100, 200 people sitting on the floor, 300 people seated in the, in the chairs, and 200 of us scattered in the floor. Then they had to open up the wall, and they had to put glass walls there. They put speakers for us to be able to, if we came in late. And you know what late was? Late was, if the service was 7 o'clock, late was being there at 7. That was late. Because you actually stood in line to get into church. And that's what would happen with Christ. When Jesus would speak, his authority and his profound words and, and the graciousness in the way that he spoke, and his love and, and, and the power of the Spirit were all there. And so the people would show up and they went early. And this was early in the morning at daybreak at 6, 6.30 in the morning or so. And they're there waiting for him as he's teaching and he's sharing with them, speaking with that authority, speaking with that eloquence, gripping those people as he speaks. Isaiah gave a, a prophecy related to Messiah. It's found in Isaiah 50, verse 4. And it says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who's weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to, to hear as the learned. And so the words of life that he poured out attracted them. They came to hear. They would listen. And they wanted to know. There were times that they would stay with him for days at a time. You remember when he, he multiplied the fish and the loaves. He did that after he'd been there with them for so long that the, he said, I don't want them to leave this place because they may faint along the way. We need to feed them. They would be there to listen to him because the words of life that poured out of him were worth listening to. And so these words of life are what they've come for. And it says again in verse 2, early in the morning, he came again into the temple. All the people came to him. He sat down and taught them. When a rabbi was speaking words of, 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 uh, that were heavy, uh, he would be seated as he taught. And so it would show reverence for the word of God and the importance of it. And so as he was speaking, he was giving them lessons. But at this moment, he's about to give them a visible lesson, a visible lesson about God. He's going to reveal to them something. He's going to reveal to them in a very practical way that, that God is loving, that God is gracious, that God is forgiving, and that God is merciful. And, and the way this lesson is going to come about is, is in the way that he, he, tashes, he treats a woman, a woman who was caught in the act of sin. He's not going to minimize her sin, by the way, but he will amplify the power of forgiveness. You see... The way he's going to deal with this woman is going to reveal God, and it's also the way we today, who are representatives of the kingdom of God, it's the way we are also to treat others who have entered into sin. He's not minimizing her sin, but he is amplifying the power of forgiveness. The church is the body of Christ, and the world is to see Jesus as we live out his word by his spirit in their presence. When they look at us, they're to see a representation of what God and his grace and forgiveness actually produces in a person's life. We're supposed to be used by God to reveal to the world what the invisible God is like. In the Old Testament, the scripture taught that, that they were not to make a graven image. There were no idols to be produced by the Jews because we worship the invisible God. In the New Testament, God said, this is what I am like by taking upon himself human form and dwelling amongst men so that they may behold him filled with grace and truth so they might wonder at the gracious words that came from him. And the church who's been born again into the family of God is intended to reveal that to a world that doesn't see God. And so that's one of the reasons why our lives being transformed are such evidence that God is real. Our light so shines before men that they, they behold our good works and then they glorify our Father who is in heaven. So the church is supposed to teach the world what God is like. Now, there are members of the church who, who, who present God as uh, kind of like a tolerant grandfather. So he looks down upon earth and he sees the sins of men Anything that a professing believer does is just fine with him. Well, when they teach like that, it gives a rise to a lack of convictions and no personal holiness. But on the other hand, there are those who present him as mean and overbearing. He's a tyrant filled with anger. And if you step out of line, he'll deal with you severely. 
And that's produced angry professing believers who teach that God's always mad about something. The result of both camps is people reject God because of his professing followers. And that has led to more antagonism, open antagonism towards God, as well as those who say they represent him. Perhaps some of you may have read or heard this last week or so, uh, there was a uh, Minnesota State University associate professor by the name of Eric Sprankel uh, who suggested that the Virgin Mary did not consent to being impregnated by God and thus God violated her. Yeah, this professor wrote, this is a tweet. Tweet, what an odd word. But anyway, this is a tweet. We used to have a bird called Tweety Bird, but anyway... <laughs> The virgin birth story is about an all-knowing, all-powerful deity impregnating a human teen. There is no definition of consent that would include that scenario. Happy holidays. Hmm. He also wrote, the biblical God regularly punished disobedience. The power difference between deity versus mortal and the potential for violence for saying no negates her yes. So this just came out, I think was last week. Now, Richard Dawkins, some of you have heard him, perhaps you've heard of him or read uh, his writings. Richard Dawkins is a well-known atheist. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. It was published in 2006, and this is what Dawkins wrote. Dawkins said the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, Philicidal, meaning he killed his own, chi his own child. Pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. And so that's what Richard Dawkins says about God. And that's what Eric Sprankel says about God, atheists. And that's what many people think about God. That he's um, megalomaniac, that he's... He's, he hates everybody, he's homophobic, etc. So the question has to be asked, is it true? Is this what the Bible teaches about God? Is what they're saying about God true? Well, in this incident before us, we're going to see Jesus teach them about God in a very practical way. And he's going to teach them about the mercy of God. And he's going to teach about the abundant forgiveness found in him. You see, in the Old Testament book of Daniel, in chapter 9, verse 9, Daniel said, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. When you read the writings of, of John the Apostle, the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as the book of Revelation. And when you read his writings, uh, you'll discover that, that John gave us what are called three definitive statements about God. John 4, 24, he said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In 1 John 1, 5, he said, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, he writes, he, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So he said, God is spirit, God is light, God is love. And what we're going to see with Jesus He's going to teach them about truth and light, and he's going to show them what love is. He's going to reveal to the people what God is like, because God is a God who hideth himself. Therefore, he needs to be revealed. And Jesus is going to reveal his Father to these people. And so it says again, he sat down and taught them, verse 3, the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And so Jesus is teaching very similar to what I'm doing now. He's seated, his audience is listening, he's sharing about the Lord, and then suddenly there's a disruption. 
Suddenly there's these people coming in, and you can imagine it's very loud. What's going on is very distracting. And they're entering into that portion of the temple, that outer court where Jesus is teaching. And as they come in, they're disrupting everything. And they come and they bring this woman. It says in verse 3 that they brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And they set her in the midst and said, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And so as Jesus is teaching, this disruption takes place. And the scribes and Pharisees have come with a woman. When you read your Bible and it says scribes, the scribes are the, the legal experts. They were, the, they were legal experts in the law of Moses. They were students of the law of Moses, and they were teachers of the law. They were the PhDs, the theological trained people. The Pharisees, uh, the Pharisees speak of a religious group. It's like a denomination. A Pharisee, the word Pharisee means the separated one. And they were known as the hyper-legalistic, overly outwardly righteous people of the day. There were a small amount of them. They only had about 6,000 Pharisees. They were centering most of their activities around Jerusalem, but they had a tremendous amount of influence. And so the legal experts, the religious people come and they're dragging this woman before the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice verse 3 says, they brought a woman to him that they had caught in the act of adultery. Now, just the day before, these leaders had tried to have Jesus arrested, but they were foiled. But their failure didn't deter them. They continued trying to find a way to accuse him. Now, this is taking place during the Feast of Tabernacles. And so that's a religious group, and there are a lot of people who are present. But notice how John says they brought to him this woman. He uses the word brought. He says they brought. That word brought means to compel, to seize forcefully. It speaks of them dragging her. It's not as if she was just walking calmly, in other words. They had her probably one arm. One had one arm, the other had the other. And they're dragging this woman as she's coming in before the Lord. She's not coming on her own free will. She's being dragged. When they speak to, her, to him about, it, about her, in verse 3 it says, it says they brought to him a woman caught that word caught means to grasp eagerly. They grabbed her in the very act of sexual intercourse. And when it says they set her, that means they, they forced her to stand still in front of everybody. So this woman is dragged in, forced to stand as they shout out the accusation. Jesus is teaching about God and what God is like and what God wants to do in people's lives. And then they begin to accuse her. She was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, when they say that, that means that there were at least two people who had seen her in the act of sexual intercourse. If they did not have eyewitness, they could not make this accusation. You see, adultery, and that's what they're accusing her of, is a capital offense. It required witnesses to determine if it was true. In Deuteronomy 19.15, it reads, A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he's committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed. And so they caught her, these at least two, in the physical act of intimacy. And they bring her in charged with adultery. And adultery is a grievous sin. It is prohibited by the seventh commandment. Exodus 20, verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. In Jewish thinking, it was one of the three gravest sins, along with murder and idolatry. A liberal uh, commentator by the name of William Barclay said, every Jew must die before he will commit idolatry, murder, or adultery. It's sexual intercourse with a married person other than your spouse. It was recognized as a great moral crime, bringing destruction to man's relationship with God and man's relationship with others. Because adultery destroys families, the framework of society. Throughout the scriptures from the old to the new, it is a serious sin and God warns against it. Hebrews 13, 14, for example, marriage is honorable among all and the marriage bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. It's a very serious sin in the eyes of God. And so they're bringing this test case to Jesus. And notice in verse 5 how they say, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? 
So they introduced their case by appealing to Scripture. Moses says they should be stoned to death. So they're appealing to Scripture. There's a philosopher by the name of Pascal who said this. He said, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. And so they were speaking. Moses said, such should be stoned to death. Now, verse 6 makes it very clear. They said this, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. And so basically, they put him in what would be called the horns of a dilemma. Moses said this, what do you say? If he says, well, seeing that Moses says that she should be put to death, then I say she needs to be put to death. Now, if he says that, then they'd have an accusation to lodge with the Romans because the Jews didn't have the right to conduct um, capital punishment without the authority of Rome. Uh, according to John 18, 31, when they had brought the, the Pharisees had brought Jesus before Pontius Pilate, it says, uh, Pilate said to them, you take him, judge him according to your law. But the Jews therefore said to him, it's not lawful for us to put any man to death. We don't have the freedom to do that. So if Jesus said, well, then stoner, then they could say he's violating Roman law. But if he says, let her go, then he breaks the law of Moses as they understand it. He'd be a heretic. He's disregarding the law of Moses. And so they could say he does not value the word of God. And so what you see is their concept of authority as well as their concept of Scripture. Authority is wielded with severity. It's used like a hammer. The Scripture is used to harm people. And not only that, but you see what they think about people. She's just a test case. She's not even a real person. Notice how it says it again in verse 5. Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What do you say? Such should be stoned. They don't even see her as a woman. They don't see her as a person. They see her as a thing. They see her as this kind or this sort. They don't care about her. You see the way they, they feel about people because they humiliate her in public, they accused her in public, and they condemned her in public. What they're doing is setting a trap and they want to spring this trap on him. Someone said, when the wicked go about to make a snare for good men, they make a snare for themselves. And that's what's about to take place. So as this is taking place here, notice verse 6 where it says, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he didn't hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down, wrote on the ground. And so Jesus acts as if he's not even listening to them. He stoops down and writes on the ground. So his initial response seems to be ignoring them. You see, he knew more of what she was like than her accusers ever could. They knew her actions, but he knew her reasons. Jesus knew her story and what it was that resulted in her involving herself in this kind of sin. By ignoring them, he's given them time to think. You're demanding the death of a person. The taking of a human life is never a light decision. But as he's there, not responding initially, verse 7 says, well, they continued asking. So by his lack of response, perhaps they thought that they had caught him, so they're pressing him. But when they continued asking him, he raised himself up. And that's when he said, if you're without sin, throw a stone at her. In his answer, he reminds them that they're not appointed and recognized judges. They were citizens who didn't have the legal right to make this kind of demand. They weren't judges. They couldn't determine punishment. What they were doing was assuming the right to make this judgment. So seeing that you're not a judge, Jesus speaks of the qualifications to judge. He says, only those who have not committed serious sin like this sin should put her to death. As this is taking place, let's look at it a little bit and ask ourselves some questions. Had any of these men ever lusted after a woman? Had any of these men ever committed sexual sin themselves? And if so, uh, would they be willing, uh, if they hadn't ever done any of that, would they be willing to put her to death? Or if they had, would they be willing are they sinless themselves? 
Listen, if you're appealing to the law of Moses, you need to remember what the law requires. In Deuteronomy 17, verse 7, it says, The hands of the witnesses must be first in putting him to death. Are you ready to take that stone and to cast it at her? And as he's asking and they're thinking, again, in verse 8, he stooped down and once again he wrote on the ground. This is the only time recorded in the New Testament, by the way, that Jesus is recorded as, as writing anything. It's the only time that you ever see him writing. It reminds us of the Ten Commandments. When you look in Exodus chapter 32 and other passages that speak of this, you'll see that when Moses was given the commands, he was given two tablets, two sets. The first four commands related to man's obli obligation to God. The next commands related to man's obligation to man. In the two tablets, you see man's relationship with God as it informs his relationships with other people. And then these law and prophets are all wrapped up in this one command, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. So I find it interesting that it's recorded that he, he wrote. And the question is being asked now, what is he writing? He wrote twice. What is he writing? Because he's stooping down and he's writing. It may be that in the time that he's taking to do this, He's showing a bit of mercy to her accusers, giving them time to think. And there are a lot, of, a lot of people who wonder, what is it that he could have been writing? Well, obviously, when Scripture is silent, we really don't know. We don't want to impose on Scripture that which we don't know. It has been wondered out loud, though, whether or not he might be writing the command that they're appealing to. It's a possibility, of course. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, could be that command. But here's what the command says. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Where's the man? If you want to appeal to Scripture and you want to put a woman to death and you're asking me to judge and you quoted Moses saying such should be stoned, then here's my question to you. Where's the man? Because the law, if you want to appeal to it, isn't just against the woman. The law was against sin. Sin committed by a man and a woman. And we all know, and it hasn't changed a whole lot here in the 21st century, that women and men very often don't pay the same penalty. The man sleeps with the woman and goes off with his buddies, does whatever he wants, doesn't think anything about it, whatever. But the woman pays the price. Always has. Probably always will. It's the woman who worries about getting the venereal disease. It's the woman who concerns herself whether or not her honor has been lost. It's the woman who has to face her parents when she comes home, if she's still living at home, it's the woman who may get pregnant. And the man, he just goes off and does whatever he wants. And I'm not talking down on men. I'm simply saying that's a fact. That's what happens. Guys don't pay anything close to what the woman pays when it comes to intimacy like this. And so here's the woman standing there. And who knows how she's dressed? It says she was caught in the very act. I wonder if they gave her the, the time to, to at least be dressed. We don't know. It's not that they would take her out nude. I'm certain they didn't. But perhaps she may have just had enough time to grab a robe or something. She's there with the shame. You can't imagine. I can't imagine. Just think about it. If, if, if that happened here in this room right now, if those doors burst open in the back and somebody was being dragged here up the aisle and everybody would be, be, be seated in, in shock, disbelief, and, there's, and they say, look, you talk about a God of love? Well, this one here just was, what do you say? And how would she feel? Because very often we don't really even think about how that young lady would have felt. How did she feel? You know, one of the things that I, I have grown to, to grown over the years in this is, is to have a love and a compassion for those who've been caught in sin like this. I can't imagine the shame she would have felt. But I also have gone so far as to begin to think what was her life like? Because during the time uh, of Christ, the idea was that a, that a woman would one day, she would, she would 
be betrothed to a man. The man would pay a dowry for her because he valued her. He would give her a great wedding. She, she, would, she would be loved. She would have babies. She'd be a woman of, of respect in her community. Those were the things that they aspired to. They wanted to be a, a great wife and a, a great mama. They wanted that. And, and, and many women to this day still do. Uh, we, we still see little girls who, who, no matter what we try and say, oh, they'll decide whether they're a boy or they're a girl later. Oh, no, they don't. There's something deep within them that the little girl will play with a doll and play house. And, 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 and we, we've seen that. We're raising our daughters. We have granddaughters. We've seen that where they want to get married. One day, I have little granddaughters who are talking already about one day when I get married. And I say, no, you're not. You're not getting married. No, you're not. You know, oh, it's going to be my baby. Nobody's going to marry you. But, you know, that, that's already in their heart to be a mama, to be a wife. And this, this young lady, guys, what makes her any different? What would make her any different than all of the young ladies that, and little girls she grew up with? And we, we have to put ourselves in that place for just a moment to, to try and understand where compassion comes from. I mean, something happened in her life. Something hurt her deeply. Something that made her willing to do what she was doing. And we could talk about sin nature and how we have a propensity to do that which we desire and to violate God's law because we have sin that's wrapped up within us. Of course, that's all true. There are circumstances that lead to choices that lead to lifestyles. And this young lady made a series of choices in a small arena of friends and acquaintances to the degree that she ended up in the temple more than likely half-dressed in front of a Jewish rabbi and a crowd being accused by religious leaders of being a whore that should be put to death. Moses commanded us. It isn't a suggestion. He commanded us in the law that such should be stoned. What do you say? We don't care about this woman. It's not this woman we're worried about. We were watching her because she had a reputation. That's how we were able to burst in on her while she was in the very act. It was a setup. And we were able to take her. And we caught her. And we are eyewitnesses. And the law says she must be put to death. What do you say? And this woman had no dignity she was not being cared for or loved in any way, shape, or form. She was a victim of what these men were doing. It's interesting how it says in verse 9, after he had said, if you have no sin, be the first to cast a stone at her, and he's writing on the ground. It's interesting how verse 9 says, those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone in the woman standing in the midst. From the oldest to the last. Why the oldest to the last? Because the older we get, the more sins we've committed. There's no sinner like an old sinner. So when you're younger, and I've seen this be true in my own life, as a younger man, I was much more rigid. As I grew older, I grew more merciful. Because the longer you live, the more you understand that bad decisions are made. Bad decisions are made. And sometimes they weren't made because you wanted to. Sometimes they were made because circumstances gave you permission to and you yielded to the temptation rather than praying and seeking the Lord. You made your mistakes and your sins. And you know it. As you grow older, you eventually get to the point where you're like that man who was standing next to that self-righteous man that Jesus speaks of when he said he just kept pounding on his chest saying, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. You get to that point in life after a while where you realize you're not as good as you think you are. You're not as good as you thought you were when you were a kid. As you grew older, you had greater opportunity. And so you can almost see these guys with, with, with these heavy stones in their hand. And one by one, you can almost hear those stones as they release them and they start hitting the ground. Until there's the younger ones who are still standing there because the younger ones... Don't think they're that bad. But the older were, older were convicted by their conscience from the oldest even to the last. Time and failure is supposed to combine to produce self-awareness. Time and failure, self-awareness, 
should produce humility because I know that I'm a failure. So what's going on here? Well, Jesus is working within the law. Without accusers, there's no punishment. In John 8, 17, it's written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. And so what he's doing is he's frustrating their plans. Job 5, 12 says he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. And that's what he's doing. And now it says in verse 9, second portion, that Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. It is not said that all the people went out, but only her accusers. So Jesus is teaching us how to act in the face of sin. How do you act? You act with an offer of grace to the sinner. What is my attitude to be like towards them? Well, gracious. Because it says in verse 10, when Jesus had raised himself up, saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. And so Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and continue in sin. No, he didn't say that. He said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. How did he respond? Grace, is there anyone here accusing you? I could almost say I'm, he, was, he was 33 years old, but as an older man, I would probably have said, is no one accusing you, baby? Because I call the younger women that I work with baby because they're like my, my daughters. And I see them that way. I actually have told them, because I have young, some young staff members, and I'll say, you don't mind me calling you that, do you? And I said, I'm not some lecherous old guy going, ha, ha, baby. You know, I, <laughs> I just call my, my daughters that. I call my granddaughters that. I, it's just an endearment. Is that okay? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Okay, fine. I just don't want you to think I'm weird. You know, but I can hear the tone of Christ. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Has no one accused you? Where are your accusers? Have you ever heard that? I have. I have. Where are your accusers? I've got plenty of them. But I don't accuse you. What's that do to you? I don't accuse you. No. Go and sin no more. He's not giving her permission to stay in sin. He's not saying go back to your lover. He didn't say that. See, this is one of the areas the church needs to grow in. You're not giving someone permission to continue in sin. You're giving them grace so they can be free from it. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He didn't teach that adultery was, was acceptable. It's not. It's a grievous sin. It destroys families. And there's eternal punishment because of it. No, he wasn't giving permission to sin. He's giving her freedom from its power. And that's what grace does. It sets you free from sin's power. Sin shall not have dominion over me because I've been set free by the blood and power of Jesus Christ, you see? That's how it works in the Christian life. And that's what we offer other people. He offered her grace. He offered her forgiveness. Go, he says, sin no more. Don't continue in sin any longer. And what is he doing? He's, get, he's setting this woman free. The one whom Jesus sets free, the son sets free, is free indeed. He's setting her free, but he's also modeling God in front of the witnesses who are there. He's showing them the God that we worship isn't this brutal tyrant who violates weak human beings' will. He's a God who loves, who draws us. According to Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Jesus in Luke 19, 10 said, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. What are you teaching us, Lord? To be compassionate to be understanding, but to walk in a holy way. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. 
old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You don't go back to the vomit. You don't go back to the mud. You go into the light. You walk with Christ. Your life is changed by the grace of God. Christmas. So many people say, no, it's about family, getting together, eating a little too much, maybe drinking a little more than you should. That's Christmas. No, it's not. Christmas is God with us. God showing us what the invisible God is like. A God of love and mercy who is willing to take upon himself human flesh that he might pay the penalty that I owed. I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God took upon himself my sin and he set me free. That's Merry Christmas. That's why we say Merry Christmas because the baby who was placed in a manger was also placed on a cross. And then he was placed in a tomb. But on the third day, he rose from the dead. And he ascended into heaven. And he sends the Spirit to dwell within those who love him. He transforms our lives through the grace, mercy, compassion, and forgiveness of God. And so when Jesus was there, and these people were saying, tell us what God is like, he showed them. God is full of mercy and compassion, filled with grace and love, and he forgives, and he does not condemn, and he sets you free to live for him so that you not only walk on this earth, but you can leap and praise God in heaven. You walk not only on earthly streets, but one day you'll be walking on streets of gold, and you'll be thanking the Lamb who ever lives for the salvation and mercy he showed to you because of his goodness to man. That's the God that we serve. Not an angry, vindictive God, but a righteous, loving Father who gave his Son so that I might know him. That is the God that I praise. That is the God of my mercy. We need to remember that. We need to remember that every day.